Hello and welcome to Inside Healthcare for the very latest news on COVID-19 and information on the first COVID-19 rapid test now available here in Minnesota. We go right to the front lines to talk with Dr. Craig Maddox, the new medical director at the Urgency Room, who is joining us now by Zoom. So thank you, Dr. Maddox, for being with us. We appreciate that. My pleasure. So um, I understand that you're offering this rapid COVID-19 um, test at the Woodbury Urgency Room. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how the test works, um, how you get it, and, and what do we know about it? So the, the test is a um, specimen that's uh, run from a nasal swab. So as opposed to a deep swab into the back of the nasal passage or into the throat, this is actually just sort of inside the nostril. Um, it's a molecular test, which is essentially looking for evidence of the uh, COVID-19 virus in the nasal passage. So it's a very sensitive and accurate test when it identifies the presence of the virus. Um, and the nice thing about this test is that it's results within 20 minutes of specimen collection wow. as opposed to the send out, which usually takes between two to five days. So um, when a, a patient comes in and gets tested, do they just wait wait for the results or do you get back to them on it or? Right, so we... And can they do a drive-through? We've seen that at, at other places. Yeah, the, I think around the country there have been drive-through testing sites. That's not a service that we have the capacity to offer. Um, we have a limited supply that we can offer the community on a daily basis and it's really a function of the supply that we get from Abbott Labs, the vendor who supplies us with the test kits. Um, and so patients actually overran our supply the first three days that we offered it uh, two weeks ago um, and we had to identify a different process and so what we're doing now is we're asking people to sign up for testing through our website, uh, the urgency room, and then we do same day scheduling so that we can attempt to control the volume of traffic um, for testing and volume of traffic at our site. Um, and patients get swabbed inside the building so it's not drive through testing and they uh, get the result before they leave and that's part of the service that we offer is um, a visit with the provider who can talk to you about you know, what uh, precautions you need to take if you actually return positive, what the value of a negative test result is, and give you anticipatory guidance about things to look out for moving forward, what would constitute a reason for being retested or reseen, um, those kinds of things. So. Who, who are you recommending that they come, they come in to get this test? Well, we, we are following the Minnesota Department of Health guidelines on testing. And so certainly symptomatic patients, so those patients that have fever, chills, or maybe respiratory symptoms like cough or shortness of breath. And then some of the other less obvious uh, symptoms that can be associated with coronavirus, this COVID-19 infection, which you know, specifically to this one, it's loss of uh, taste or smell uh, there are GI symptoms, gastrointestinal symptoms like nausea, vomiting, or diarrhea. Oh, I hadn't heard those. Yeah. Yeah, and then there are even more vague ones of just, I have a headache, I feel achy all over, um, I have a sore throat. Uh, those are some of the less obvious symptoms. So patients certainly with symptoms we want to get tested. Uh, patients that have uh, had an, a known exposure, so you have a family member who's tested positive or a coworker who's tested positive. Um, those are certainly people that we want to see. And then the, the big category that I think really exploded in the last two weeks, uh, again, based on recommendations from MDH were, you know, as the economies reopened and as we've seen a lot of um, social gatherings as a consequence of some of the protesting that's been going on um, the holiday season. So people who are um, in social gatherings of greater than five people, um, they're considered at higher risk for contracting COVID because we know that there are asymptomatic carriers out there. Um, and if you're not practicing social distancing and not wearing your mask, 
um, you're at higher risk. And so NDH, the uh, Minnesota Department of Health recommended that if you've been in one of those public gathering settings, you know, five days later, you should probably go in and get tested. Yeah, we're just coming off of the 4th of July holiday weekend, and I know a lot of people are gathering. And I think we've been hearing to more of a risk or less of a risk if they're outdoors in the groups right. versus indoors. But again, you're saying that even if they don't have symptoms, if they've been in something like this, they should um, schedule an appointment to get tested. That's, that's correct. And again, it's, you know, the challenge is trying to catch people early in the course of the illness so they know how to quarantine and, you know, physically distance, isolate themselves from high risk uh, members of the community or uh, avoid going to work if they have to uh, work in a essential, you know, job setting where they don't have the luxury of being able to work remotely. Um, if they have symptoms, um, certainly they should be tested, and if they are asymptomatic but are positive, they sh should be at work because mm -hmm. they run the risk of spreading it to the community. And try to isolate themselves from even family members in a closed setting. Um, yes. What about um, hearing conflicting things? Is there a cost to this test, or what is the cost, and does insurance cover it? Yeah, the, I mean, there is, there has been some conflicting information out there, and certainly we are fielding calls about uh, from patients that we've seen about whether their insurance is covering the complete cost of the visit or what have you. Um, the test itself costs about fifty dollars. Um, However, as I mentioned, we aren't doing drive-through testing, so it's not just the cost of the test that uh, would be billed to uh, patients' insurance. They're getting uh, the lowest level visit charge that we can, especially for those patients that are asymptomatic. Um, and you know that's going to vary between one hundred and seventy-five and two hundred and twenty-five dollars, uh, depending on a person's insurance. Whether their insurance is actually covering the whole cost of that is unclear. Mm -hmm. I think in the beginning, it, you know, there were pledges made um, publicly that insurance companies would be covering the cost of this. I think what they've come upon is this challenge of people who are being retested and retested or people who are, who are positive and then returning to work and now want to be tested to prove they're negative to allow them to go back to work. And we're really just sending people people back to their insurance companies to talk about what their benefit coverage is because we don't have insight into all the, the various coverage models that uh, patients have. Good information to know. Um, I know that uh, as we had mentioned um, or we're finding a number of people do not have any symptoms so um, if they come in what what percentage of people that are coming in are you how many are you testing on a daily or weekly basis and, and then also of that what percentage are testing positive? And so that, those are good questions. We, we test, um, before the rapid test became available, when we were just doing send out testing, we were testing anywhere between 30 and uh, 40 patients a day. Um, with the rapid testing, we've been able to increase that um, upwards of 60 patients a day. Um, and then the different categories uh, of positivity sort of depend on you know, your presentation. So if you're sick, you know, that population that we test tends to be about 10 to 12, uh, sometimes as high as 13% positive. This group of people that we're testing that have been completely asymptomatic and just in public gatherings, we're seeing a positive rate between five and a half and seven percent, which is still pretty high. Mm -hmm. uh, patients that have not had that public exposure risk that are just being tested randomly, that positivity rate is around one to two percent. You know, we've also yeah. been he hearing um, some saying, well, if you get it, it's not that bad. Um, but what do you tell to people? What do you say, t what is your advice to people about COVID-19 and, and it is a serious and a potentially deadly disease? I mean, that's the concern, right? I mean, this is certainly not like seasonal influenza that we have a good handle on which is also a you know can be a devastating condition to get under the you know right circumstances um so i mean it is true that the vast majority of people who contract covid will have a mild illness that's the good news the the bad news is you don't know if you're going to be one of those people or not 
And we are still seeing young people, middle-aged uh, individuals with no comorbidities who still get quite ill from this um, and can take a long time to recover. So you never know which category you're gonna be in until the end. Um, that's one thing. And then the second thing really is that it might be great that you have a mild illness. The problem is if you aren't being careful in practicing you know, the physical distancing and mask wearing um, and hand hygiene uh, that is being recommended, you run the risk of transmitting it to someone who may not fare quite as well as you. And there are there's a wide category of conditions that make someone at higher risk for having a bad outcome. You know, I think the, the latest number I saw from um, the a average age is around 38 years of age that you're finding here, that we're finding here in Minnesota. Um, we just have a couple of minutes left here. So um, you mentioned about um, some of the precautions, the mask and stuff. What is the latest on the CDC or the Minnesota Health on what should people be doing to protect themselves against this virus? I mean, the critical things are right. If you're ill or have symptoms, you need to stay home and quarantine. Stay away from your family, stay away from your place of employment. You shouldn't be socializing. When you go out for necessary activities, do so, but with a mask on and keep your six feet of distance. I think one of the, you know, the newest concerns, of course, is some data coming out saying that this virus isn't just spread through droplet, which is the larger size uh, droplet that six feet seems to protect us against. If it comes in an aerosolized form, which are smaller droplets, which tend to hang in the air longer, then that six feet of uh, social distancing or physical distancing may not be enough. Um, so I think absolutely, if you're outside, you need to be wearing a mask um, unless you can be certain that you're maintaining at least six feet of distance between yourself and someone else. I know here at the studio we're doing that, and I was wearing my mask before we started. So um, yeah. it's really been a pleasure to have you with us. So thank you so much for taking time to be with us. Great information yeah. for our viewers, and, and um, thank you for all you're doing to help save lives, too. Appreciate that. Thanks, to, thanks, Dr. Maddox. Still ahead, a familiar face to Minnesota television viewers, longtime Carrie 11 anchor Diana Pierce joins us with an important message for you. We'll hear from her right after this short break. Hi, my name is Chris Ayersman, and I'm the Director for Infectious Disease at the Minnesota Department of Health. I know that COVID-19 is on everyone's minds. Slowing the spread of COVID-19 is vital for protecting our communities. Right now, it is important for people to cancel large gatherings and practice social distancing. And what this means is making sure that you're maintaining a distance of about six feet between people. Continue washing your hands, covering your cough, and cleaning frequently touched surfaces. Stay home when you're sick. I'll say that again stay home when you're sick. That is the most important thing. We know these recommendations mean disruption to your lives, but they are so important. We need to slow the spread of the virus so that we don't overwhelm our hospitals and clinics. Thank you for doing your part. If we work together, we can manage this situation. COVID-19 has people across Minnesota and across the country avoiding going to the hospital, even for a trip to the emergency room during COVID-19. If you're one of them, longtime Carrie 11 anchor Diana Pierce has a message for you and says, if something is wrong with your body, you need to let your doctor know right away. It could save your life. So I was diagnosed with Bell's palsy, but because of my mom having a severe stroke, uh, I didn't know what was going on. I saw some of the signs of what I knew were a sign of stroke. So it was, uh, my face was a little off and it was drooping a little bit, especially in my smile. I could tell that it did not match the other side. I didn't really feel that my speech was all that off, but in hindsight and also seeing some of the recordings that I did, yes, that was also off as well. So. Um, when I got back from a trip, and actually it was two or three days of being away from here, and then coming back, I sent a note to my care provider and they said, and they called me back the following day and said, we want you to go to the hospital right now. And so they 
put me through all the tests that actually you would uh, look at for a stroke. They drew blood, they did an MRI, they looked at several different things, and they, we thankfully were able to rule that out as a result of ruling all the blood tests out and things like that. That's when we went back to the uh, Bell's palsy diagnosis. And so I posted that on Facebook. Lots of people responded to it. In fact, I was amazed at how many people responded to that. Um, but what I wanted to do was also remind people about strokes because of my mom's situation. And so um, there's an acronym to be able to remember. It's called FAST. So um, we can, so the first thing would be face. And so that's the thing that right off the bat, that's what I was noticing, and especially the drooping on one side of the mouth. And so if you see somebody that all of a sudden their face is off just a little bit, um, they, that might be sign of a stroke, especially if for something, if you might know that they have heart disease or some type of pro, uh, your problem like that in their back or on a family member, a uh, close family member, um, and because of my mom's situation, she was at home by herself. So they didn't immediately, a friend of hers called and she didn't respond. So that's, he called her then later in the afternoon. And so then they sent the ambulance over and they, they took her in at that particular point. So, but if you're around a person and you start to see these things happen, um, take note of them. So again, face and, and the smile, especially kind of being a little off. A then stands for arm and arm weakness. And so I didn't have that, but in the hospital, they tested me for that because they wanted me to raise both arms. And then if you are having a stroke, then one of the arms or the side of the stroke might start to droop on its own because there's not enough um, strength in that arm to show that. Then S then is for speech. And like I said, my speech was, I, I didn't notice it. But if you know somebody is trying to have a conversation with you and all of a sudden they're not making sense or their speech is slurred in some manner, that's also a sign of a stroke. And then finally, time, and that's T, that's time to act. And that's the call 911. So that's why when a few of these other things were coming into play, that's when they wanted me to go down to the hospital and get those tests immediately to at least rule that out. See, heart disease runs uh, pretty strongly in my family. My dad had quadruple bypass surgery when he was in his 60s, and my mom had her stroke when she was in her late 60s, early 70s. And so um, just very cognizant of, of these things. And I wanted to make sure that I acted quickly. And I know that in her case, if she had acted quickly, or I'm sorry, not if she had acted quickly, or if she had been around some people that would have noticed some of these signs, she might have gotten treatment sooner. And if you're in with a in a hospital situation, especially with a stroke, the sooner you get treatment, the better off uh, your results will be over time. You did the great thing. You did go to your doctor. You did go to the hospital to get the test. A lot of people, I think the CDC said like up to like 42% of people are not going to the doctor, are not going to the ER because of COVID-19 or fears of that. So such an important message that if you have any symptoms, mm -hmm. you should seek help regardless right. of what else is going on. I did talk to the, the provider on that. And so because I started there first and, and she got me on the telephone, uh, she was basically the, the one and, and she was connected to my uh, insurance company. And so it wasn't, it wasn't my physician, it was the uh, provider. And so when we were talking about those things, you know, during that phone conversation, she was basically saying, okay, I want you to go to the ER right now. And um, it just kind of struck me. And so I said, so, and it was a mild case, by the way. It was a very mild case. I took prednisone for 15 days and had some of the side effects that prednisone gives you. But again, I'm, I'm done with that now. And so the thought of going into a hospital during COVID-19, um, 
uh, for me, it's kind of like if you're going to have it and be around people, that's like one of the safest places to be because of everybody wears a mask, everybody has a temperature check, everybody is isolated uh, in every step of this particular process. So um, I wasn't, uh, wasn't fearful at all of, of going in and making sure that this other issue was dealt with. Well, that's such an important message to get that out to everyone that might be watching this too. If they see a loved one with any of these symptoms, you know, to take action and, and not avoid, please do not avoid the urgency room or the ER or your doctor. That right. could be helpful. Final comments for our viewers on the message that you want to leave with them about the stroke awareness and about staying safe during this time, especially now. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I, as you mentioned, you know, I know that a lot of people are hesitant. A lot of people are are putting off all of their 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 doctors if they appointments if they have questions. So, uh, if this is something that runs in your family, you see these symptoms, go ahead and take care of it. You know, fast. Make sure that you're doing it that way. Um, but uh, there seems like there's so many ways of reaching out to your healthcare providers these days. You know, sending them an email. They're getting online doing teleconferencing these days. So uh, I think if there's any questions or any fears that you might, or concerns that you might have, you know, please address this with them so that they can tell you exactly what to expect. When I went to the ER, I had to go by myself. They made sure that, you know, that it, I could do that and I was admitted singularly. I was basically sitting in the ER and there was only one other person there. I, I did talk to the staff when I walked out and they said earlier in that day had been busier, but uh, regardless, uh, it was, you know, they, they tell you come by yourself if you're able uh, because they don't want to have any additional uh, people in, in the ER, you know, that in, in that particular case. So again, act fast, make sure you take care of you first. Diana, really a pleasure to have you with us and you're looking great and it's such an important message to get out. So thank you so much. All right. Thank you, Jody. Thank you. As the COVID-19 continues, so does the nation's opiate crisis. Doctors with the American Medical Association are concerned about increases in opiate-related overdoses during this pandemic, and they have just issued a national public health warning. We don't know the true impact for a couple of years. However, the most recent data shows that more than 67,000 people have died from opiate overdoses in 2018 in the United States. Josiah was one of them. Here's his story. We're all perfect in this town. High up on my head sits my crown but That don't matter now Just laid my oldest boy in the ground Josiah was a perfect student and child he ended up acing his ACT, got a 100% score on his ACTs. So it's a hat trick, and that's when you get three goals a game. And Josiah had a few of those. You could tell that his appearance was kind of like changing. I never saw him as someone that dabbled in drugs. When we saw him, we knew that uh, we, we were in for a long haul. My heart sinking and just, just thinking, oh my goodness, what's going on? January 23rd, 2018. The worst day of my entire life. I forever, that, that positioning of him is forever embedded in my head, in my memory. I think the peace is knowing that his, his struggle's over. His fight with the devil's over. Hard, hard drugs like that is, all the way is, is this. 
and I understand you're talking about it. I've been in police work for over 30 years and this one has a different feel to it and I think a lot of it is because of how deep the roots ran. The pain meds that were prescribed uh, by physicians, uh, they were being overprescribed. We were constantly being told it's unacceptable for your patients to have pain. We need a rehab facility here. We need it for our community. There's so much that is, is going on with our epidemic. As soon as people feel what opiates feel like, you just can't get away from it. It puts its claws into you. The synthetics that are going around now, it has become Russian roulette. Two things happen. Either they finally get their life together and finally follow and practice a program, or they die. For me, watching other people that have gone through it and seeing how their lives have changed negatively because of drugs and alcohol really helped me to realize how dangerous they can be. He was on opiates and he was high and he fell off a two-story building and hit his head real bad and he died, he bled out of his head. Last year, more people died from overdoses than the Vietnam War. So if you put that into perspective for a moment. He led the life of the all-American kid. As soon as he got into opiates, he lost everything. In the beginning of our journey with Josiah, it was extremely lonely. There is 1% recovery rate for heroin IV users. Stop funding their death. Stop spewing hate all over them. If you have an addict, chances are you've been stolen blind. The full-length feature documentary by Minnesota filmmaker Joe Carlini was scheduled to premiere in Minnesota theaters in April, but all screenings were canceled due to COVID-19. We'll let you know when the documentary is rescheduled for a theater near you. Well, that's our program for you. Thank you for watching. Join us again next time on Inside Healthcare. See you then, everyone.